Dr. Brian Lee. How are you, brother? Chris, I'm great. So happy to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you on the program. You were, uh, we were at the Westminster Conference the other day, and I saw you, and I said, I've got to grab this guy for the program. He's here, and uh, this is one of the nice things about living down here is that we get a lot of stream of guys coming yeah, through. People pass through. I, I can, I can pull them into the podcast. So, but anyways, well, Washington um, D.C. is like that a little bit too, but they're different kind of people. <laughs> I'm sure. I am sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but good to have you here. Uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit today, at least introduce uh, some of our listeners to you. Um, you know, I know you've uh, you've got you were how long have you been in D.C. again? As a I moved planner? there about 20 years ago. OK. Um, and I didn't move there to plant a church. Right. I was I worked in the government for a number of years. Right. But uh, we began a church plant with the Bible study in 2007. Right. We had our first worship service the Sunday after Reformation Day 2007. So right. come 16 plus years coming up on 17. Right. So for our listeners, Brian's a fellow minister in the United Reformed Churches of North America. Um, it's been good to get to know you over the years. I never overlapped with you and Sam. You were before me. You yeah, were, you were kind of that, you. that yeah. rugged class that came before us. But um, anyways, uh, it's so it's good to have you. So I, I thought today we could talk a little bit about church planning. Yeah. And, um, you know, I see guys that are intensely interested in this. I'm interested in this. I always felt when I went into the ministry, I... I didn't feel the pull to that. Yeah, um, I always felt like I was kind of wired to go into an established church. I was young when I first went in, 27. Felt like I needed really strong elders around me. Mm-hmm. And I, I realized with church planners, at times, you're kind of taking this thing all up yourself and trying yeah. to find good elders, right, yeah. to come in and help. But I thought maybe you could tell a little bit, first, biographically, about you, your background. Yeah. Um, you've done doctoral studies. Uh, tell us a little bit about you, and then we'll get into some of the church planning stuff. Well, I've jokingly called myself an accidental church planner before because, <laughs> like you, I wasn't drawn to it. I mean, I was yeah. drawn to academics, mm-hmm. and I came to Westminster, and then I, I went and did doctoral work with Richard Muller yeah. in historical theology, the history of and development of covenant theology yeah. in the Reformed tradition. And I love that stuff, and I was on the academic job market, and uh, like many people, it's a tough market. Yeah. And plan B it's for me, uh, for friends and personal interest. I was interested in, in politics and public policy. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, one of those 2K guys who actually enjoys politics. <laughs> yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I went to D- DC uh, where I had friends and I worked there for a number of years, uh, legislative branch, executive branch, didn't quite get to the judicial branch, but I was sure. in the justice department for a little while. And so I had a lot of experience there and it was really my experience living in DC, mm-hmm. um, realizing I wasn't called to government service. And also looking out at a church landscape that while there were a number of good churches, mm-hmm. there wasn't a, a confessionally reformed continental church. Right. Uh, there wasn't churches like so many in our tradition that was uh, liturgical, sacramental. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my view of, of church planting, especially like URCs in the light of our sister churches in the PCA, OPC, mm-hmm. other Presbyterian bodies, is, you know, the Reformation is, is a harmony of voices. Mm-hmm. And there's a richness that comes from the Heidelberg Catechism. Yeah. Uh, right. That comes from the Belgic Confession, mm-hmm. and we're at our best when we're working together with mm-hmm. these guys, right? right. And um, and especially, you know, in the city itself, it was at that time a wasteland. It's gotten better. Sure. And this was, you know, within ten years of when Mark Dever had arrived there. So he was right. doing wonderful things in the in the Baptist world, right. um, on Capitol Hill. But um, yeah, in terms of confessionally reformed presence in the city, it was practically zero. Yeah, yeah. What what, what an opportunity. Yeah. I mean, you know, do you think our, our the Presbyterian Reformed churches historically, at least in America, that we have been, you know, in terms of mission, in terms of, you know, I, I, we support a lot of causes. Yeah. And I always thought, you know, we should be aiming at the church plants, aiming at planning churches. Do you think we've, and I'm, I'm not asking you to indict all the Presbyterian Reformed churches here with this question, but do you think, you think we've been strong at this? Do you think this is something that we have been we've given proper attention to. I'm just curious what your thought is on that, because I, I always feel somewhat guilty. I've got an established church. Yeah. We've got, we've got a lot of things we're doing here. We support a lot of causes. We pray for the welfare of the city. We do all these things, but I always feel like we leave the church planning and and at least the church planners out in the dust a bit. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, back to another reason why uh, I felt called to plant this church, mm-hmm. uh, just to be a little bit more granular. Um, I yeah. remember coming out of church services, fine church services, where I just thought, you know, our preaching of the word is not robust, and we have right. we have a unique vision here at Westminster Seminary. Yeah, right. uh, we've learned in terms of redemptive historical law and gospel, mm-hmm. this idea of promise and fulfillment yeah. 
it's so unique and it's so beautiful. And I went into so many, a number of, of really wonderful churches in DC where there were incredibly powerful intellectual people and they would go into church on Sunday and be fed sort of gruel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In terms yeah, of interesting, in terms of yeah. weak, inspirational mm-hmm. stuff, um, moralistic stuff. Yeah. And I mean, I'll be honest. I thought it would be easy to plan a church because I thought <laughs> yeah. everything that I love so much uh-huh. about what I learned here. Everyone at else would. <laughs> everyone else would too, right? And right. that's that old problem right. of, yeah. of um, you know, the problem of the person who wants to communicate a message knows it too well yeah, and loves it too well mm-hmm. to understand uh, what what they have to bridge mm-hmm. to bring it to people. And, yeah. um, and so it, it's, I, I thought there would be a big appetite for it, but it's not. And this is the sense in which the, the pastors, ministers as pastors, you lead people, you know, right. when you put food out for right. an animal, they're drawn to it. Right. Right. And so there's a push and pull to healthy preaching. And, yeah. and I, I don't think, um, I think what we have done poorly, and I think sort of what, you know, we discussed a little bit about talking about today mm-hmm. is I think what we've done pr- poorly is, is thinking strategically right. about what right. are the ingredients. Every church mm-hmm. plan is a unique thing, but what are the ingredients and, and is it worthy infrastructure mm-hmm. that we can build? that can, um, as you say, support and come around church planters mm-hmm. and make this difficult work inherently right. um, 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 uncertain work, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, our ecclesiology, you know, we're, we have a lifetime call to the ministry. Yeah. Um, how do you call a guy lifetime to a work that might close its doors in three to five I know. years? And, and to recognize going in, that's a possibility. Yeah. It's a tough pill to swallow. One of our, one of our sister churches brought a, an overture, um, I think we brought it to Synod. It didn't go there, but we've sort of adopted it in our classes. When you call the church planter, that letter of call should include what happens in the case the plant closes down. Yeah. How are we going to care for these people? Yeah. Because, um, you know, there's there's a certain level. Of, we organized in 2016, started the work in 2007. So there were nine years where we had oversight. Right. And then, um, but but even since 2016, in, in many ways, we aren't a... Um, an established church, you know, there's still uncertainty. Yeah. And, sure. and so sustainability is a mm-hmm. different thing from organization, right? Cause you can organize as a church with Absolutely. a handful of officers, uh, maybe still on the, on the line with budget issues. Mm-hmm. And, um, so there, you know, th- there's a way that we can, I think, come around and, and do a better job launching these men well mm-hmm. and launching the works. Well, right. do you, so, so, you know, I'm here, I'm here in Westminster country, <laughs> right down the street. I get a lot of students, coming over and they're interested in this. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered if we do it somewhat backward. I recognize, you know, when I was young, what I needed, I felt was an established church, but that was sort of backward to the thinking of the church at the time. Mm -hmm. What, what mature church wants to take a 27 year old kid and start take that risk on him. Right. You could probably close an established church pretty easily with that kind of guy. But um, you know, you think about a lot of these guys want to go in, they're young, they're ambitious. They're excited about it, but they have no idea what's coming. They have no idea the difficulty of this. I've always wondered, are we putting guys too young into this? Mm-hmm. Shouldn't it be older men yeah. who have had some established training and have, have at least been in the ministry for some period of time to take on a church planning work? I, I'd love your thoughts on that. Well, I remember back when I was starting and we started a committee in our classes, 2008, 2009, it was up and running. I didn't start that committee but someone spoke into that that committee's discussion saying that in the Christian Reformed Church, it was the case, at least in the past, that they wouldn't send a man until he had had a call to an established church. Right. I don't know how that was yeah. formulated, whether it was just common practice. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a big proponent of internships, mm-hmm. and I think there are very poor on-ramps into ministry mm-hmm. from seminary into life of the church in the URC right. because of our history of soul pastors right. um, without assistance, without associates in so many of our churches. So young guys coming out of seminary have uh, small vacant churches, very few assistant pastor positions to move into to say grow and develop, not enough internships. Um, and so I think a lot of young guys feel called to the mission field or to church planning because it's a job option. And yeah, I think and, that's and right. And that's one of many right. ways that I think our view of church planting is planter centered and not church centered yeah. in the sense that, oh, Fred has a call to, you know, Oklahoma City or someone has a passion here. And mm-hmm. I'm the like my 
my proposed book, we were joking, yeah. is, is how not to plant a church or how not to plant a reformed <laughs> church, because every yeah. chapter is a mistake I've made. Yeah. And in D.C., I and some friends uh, looked around. So we had a small group of folks, but we looked around and we saw a need. And it was totally grassroots. We we reached out then to a church and said, "Would you? Could we do a work here? How could we oversee yeah. it?" But and that's going to happen sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lots of caveats here. Every church plant is going to mm-hmm. be different, and sometimes mm-hmm. that'll go. But I think when you do get that guy with a vision or a desire, it's important early on to harness him to right. an overseeing church that invests in him and that isn't hasty. Yeah. It takes time to develop a plan. And right. To I think that's so important. Yeah. That, that overseeing church really mm-hmm. owns that work. Yeah, because some of these guys I've seen, there wasn't strategy. It's absolutely correct. They go in, they want a job. Yeah. That's how they, you know, yeah. that's how they view this. They got a family to take care of. Yeah. They're worried about this coming out of seminary. So they go into these small plants. I, I know I can think of at least two or three guys I've known since I've been here. It didn't work. Yeah. And then they become really disillusioned and frustrated, yeah. you know, with the, the church at large, the lack of strategy, the lack of support. Um, and I just don't think they were quite prepared for that. And I don't think we did a good job in strategy of, of placing them or helping them. And in I that don't process. think, I want to be really clear. I don't think the church is letting them down after the fact. Right. I think we're letting them down by not having a, uh, a structure, a vision for this front end. And so um, in one sense, we go to the church and say, why aren't you supporting these guys? Well, they went out and did some foolish things. And I'm not putting that on them. I'm putting that on the overseeing church. And hold your mic up. And um, no one ever told me to get closer to a mic before. That's the first. (laughs) Well, like, (laughs) back off. Just back (laughs) off. You can do that here. These uh, these SMBs, you kind of got to get up into them for yeah. them to have the effect. But uh, that's what I had Mark Stromberg on here. And you know what? I didn't need the mic near him. Have you ever heard his voice? Oh, oh yeah. you yeah. know. Yeah. So, but anyways, I think you're right. I, I guess I was thinking with some of these guys, you know, especially when it comes to finance, you know, they're, they're, all this burden sort of falls on yeah. them yeah. to finance the work. And then the churches, you know, I, I, we recently started here a needy church fund, yeah. planting fund yeah. in Southwest to help churches, right? That wasn't in place for a long time. Yeah. So I think that encourages them, but it also promotes accountability. But it, it creates a, it's created for them a struggle because then they feel like they're always begging for money. Yeah. You know? Well, one of my, one of my jobs in DC was uh, director of congressional affairs for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Mm-hmm. And we'd go to Capitol Hill and defend our annual budget, um, such as it was. And um, and there's a saying in D.C., budget is policy. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the old Christian adage. You, you want yeah. to know where a man's heart is, look at his checkbook. Yeah. Um, kind of a checkbook is a thing, uh, listeners, that you used to write uh, and give money <laughs> by giving a piece of paper. Yeah, what's that? That's a dated, dated <laughs> reference. But, um, y- you know, and, and so I, I think it's so true. One of the biggest mistakes I made in my haste was, uh, you know, someone said, well, I said, where do you get funding for this? I want to do this. They said, okay, you can do this. Where do you get funding? Well, just write a letter to the churches. They'll send money. And so I read a letter to all the URC churches, and I, yeah. and I only knew one or two of the churches well. And, of course, only those two churches responded. And so I'm like, well, we're doing this no matter what. And yeah. I went out, and I did it bivocationally. Right. And, um, again, there might be a time and a place for bivocational ministry, mm-hmm. but I think instead of half a man, uh, we should send two men which is what our URC has advocated for at least right. since 2001, right. the last time Synod was here in Escondido. Right. Right. And we, I don't know that we've ever done it mm-hmm. once. And Yeah, we don't even, we rarely have two men in large churches. So, yeah. when, and I think it's an entirely different thing to yeah. send two men out for a plant. It's, the work is so, it, it's similar but different. Means of grace, obviously the same. But the strategy that has to come into that, the work that has to go in that, the on the, the you have to foot, a footman on the ground, really getting out to the people. Yeah, I think we have a, a vision, and I've heard this explicitly articulated before. Like the the pastoral need, the need for pastoral manpower goes in a linear way. Yeah. with the number of people. Well, if you have fifteen people, you oh you don't need. It's easy to care for fifteen people, right? right. But the whole thing is that church planter, his job is to reach the people that aren't in the church. I know, and exactly. that's a totally so different about. task. Mm-hmm. And furthermore, another bucket of of challenge for our church planting is his job is to train leaders, mm-hmm. and often to train leaders from scratch, guys right. who didn't grow up in the URC. Right. And so our culture of leadership, of elders and deacons, is something that has to be taught. And as you know, it's mostly caught in our circles. Right. And and so it's actually it's actually inverse. The work is harder, mm-hmm. more labor intensive at the front end. And yeah. so I foolishly did that with a full-time day job 
Yeah. And I didn't even have a, a well thought out bivocational plan. Right, right, right. <laughs> and that's where you just need to slow down. And and the path of wisdom, as you so often know, is, yeah. is a path of deliberation. Yeah. It's a path of learning from your elders yeah. and um, these, these young guys. And so I think an internship where you take a young guy, mm-hmm. Put him in a in an established church, right. and use that time there to train him up, to mentor him, mm-hmm. and maybe he has the gifts, maybe he has uh, the the well rounded sort of the entrepreneurial spirit right. of operating somewhat in a vacuum without right. a lot of nearby supports. What's the type of? Can I ask this question? <laughs> What's the type of person that is a planner? Um, can is is that answerable? I think again, if we sent two men, yeah, that question would be a lot less important. Okay. Because you could build teams. Fair enough. If we sent men to places where core groups have maybe officers there, right. an elder or a deacon, you don't need a guy who could figure that, out a church budget or right. do those sorts of things. Now, in our current situation. Yeah, but most of those situations, I mean, yeah. I look at I look across PCA, most of them aren't doing that. Yeah. So the the personality, the person does factor into this, doesn't yeah. it? One of the questions we've developed over the years to ask people is is how do you how do you handle adversity mm. and how do you handle uncertainty? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned um, the attractiveness of going to an established church yeah. where you know you're going to be shepherded by the under shepherds mm-hmm. by the elders. You're going to yep. be built up. That's what you're I, be I felt I needed. In. That's what I felt I needed. And so, um, you, you know, you have to be comfortable, um, kind of operating without a net a little bit. And it's mm-hmm. it's scary, and there have been lots of moments of doubt and fear yeah. and uncertainty. Yeah. And how do you deal with anxiety? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think I think the marriage is important. What's your relationship right. with your spouse like? Because, and what's your, what's your spouse like, too? Yeah. Is she on yeah. board with this, yeah. right? I mean, that's she's a big factor in this whole thing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I asked that. I, I, I went into ministry, I you know, I'm, I've been in 20 years now. I think I've learned a few things, you know, I think, yeah, but, um, I was highly ambitious. Yeah. You know, I thought I was going to come in and solve every problem. And this was in an established church. I thought I was going to solve every problem, even though I had good elders. Yeah. I was taking on way too much myself. And I see, I see a lot of young guys go into this and I think they're, they're highly ambitious. I think godly ambition is good. Yeah. I think yeah. that's right. I think you got to have it. Um, but I, I worry about the very thing you said. When I first went in, I was beat down with some very severe uh, conflict, even even a suicide in the church. Oh, I'm so sorry. And it, it you know it almost ran me out of the ministry, right? But that was established church. I had I had good elders where where I was leaning on. I just think in these situations with planners, we've got to do a good job, like you say, of helping them through. You know, ex- what are your expectations going yeah. in? Yeah. I think expectations is a big discussion for them. Yeah. What do you think it's going to be? And and are you okay? Right. What about, what about three years if this doesn't go? Yeah. Are you, are you, you realize that might be possible? <laughs> right. I don't know what the yeah. percentages are of plants that make it and don't. Yeah. But I mean, it's a fair, it's a fair concern. Yeah. And you know, in, in 2019 in our church in DC, we got all the way to a congregational meeting considering closing the work down yeah. for lack of uh, uh, leadership at that time. Yeah. Um, because, you know, leadership officers is a necessary ingredient in the life of a healthy URC church, healthy reform church, right. uh, church, period. But in our in our uh, model, uh, um, yeah, so, you know, I, I, I think to have that support is so important, but it, it's a bit of a catch-22. And you mentioned yourself, you knew you needed to be in an established church. Mm-hmm. Well, if we're not going to send the really green guys out on the field, the problem is you get an established church, and then you're asking an established guy to leave that security behind. Mm-hmm. I know. And I know. practically, that's a very difficult thing to do. And I've had mm-hmm. that conversation, and there are some guys in the URC, you know, some of mm-hmm. them I'm, uh, who have done that um, just in recent years even. And I applaud those guys a ton. That's something I've never done and never will do, to walk away from an established church and to to take up that call out of a passion for bringing the gospel to people outside an organized church. Um, and so... I think that's where um, if we can build out the supports better, the uncertainty doesn't become a downside risk. Right. Um, right. You have to s- celebrate, well, God's calling me to this adventure. Mm-hmm. And um, and there are people in my federation and my church who have my back. Right. And that's so important. And so right. I don't think, you know, uncertain, you're never going to get rid of the uncertainty. And mm-hmm. we could all say we trust God's providence and the sovereignty of God. But that's, you know, that's, 
that's a hard thing to apply to real mm-hmm. life when you're talking yeah. about like a, a career path. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So do you, do you think do you, I like, I like what you're saying about sending two. Yeah. I think there's so much wisdom in that, Brian. I think there's so much wisdom. Um, do you think there's a danger in a guy going out and doing a church plant? And, and, and this is the thing with church planning. It's so circumstantial, right? You could have the right sort of chemistry, the right moment, the right dynamics that come in and this thing takes off in a way that, yeah. you know, may not in another situation. And in God's providence, that's how, that's how it goes, right? We yeah. can't figure that out. But um, I wonder, do you think there's a danger at times for a young church planner that since he's taking all this on himself without maybe another accountable partner in the, in the work that the, the plant gets built around him yeah. too much. I've always wondered about that. Um, I mean, I think, I think any church planter, that's a risk. Yeah. Um, you know, I, some church planters say, well, our older model was only daughter churching, like sending people out from a larger church to a mm-hmm. neighboring community. That's maybe a, a longish commute or something mm-hmm. like that. And I know that's happened even in this area. Right. And, yeah. um, and, and some people say, well, yeah, but we have to be bolder than that. We have to go into complete regions where there's no URCs mm-hmm. and do works at a distance. I'm sort of an all of the above guy. You're an all of the above. Okay. But, um, but a, a daughter church is a situation where I think that's the safest and we should pursue more of it. I think some of our large okay. churches should. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that very thing. I like that. Um, all right. Okay. So, yeah. so I'm here in Escondido. You know, we've got we've got a fairly large church. Yeah. Um, we've planted Oceanside and Santee. Yeah. Um, Partly the, because you had people commuting there, right? Yeah, from there. and, and it, 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 they both worked. You know, yeah. there's been struggles, but yeah. uh, you know, they, they both they both are still in existence. Mm-hmm. I'm in the city of Escondido. We've got what 150 thousand here people. It's a lot of people. You know, not obviously not as much as down San Diego, but you know, we have we have a fellow PCA here. We've got a few other small reform churches. You, you think we should be planning here? You think, it, w- what's the strategy for a larger church that has a lot of resource? What do you think, I think I've always wanted to, to get some insight on this question from a church planner. Yeah. yeah. What do you think our responsibility should be to help in, in this in this venue of church planning? Yeah, venture? that's a great question. And um, so like, you know, this weekend, um, someone talked to me about the fact that uh, Valley Center is growing. And it is. There's, there's, it's there's, and, you know, and I see a lot of construction in Escondido, right? Like yeah. the cost of living in San Diego mm-hmm. is driving people further out north yeah. in different directions. And so I think, um, you know, one of my visions for internships, and we have this in Classes East, and and God blessed us with a, a church that sold its property, closed its doors, I think 20 years ago now, right. and, and dedicated the proceeds from that sale to the planting of churches in our classes. Mm -hmm. And so we have a fund over a million dollars that has really transformed things. Great. That's a, that's a separate issue. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we established with that fund was church planting internships, anything from a summer internship to a a year long internship. And so what if a large church like this, you know, you might already have a number two and associate. Mm -hmm. What if you said, um, and, and I think, again, funding helps, right? So our classes will pay half of this for one of our churches. Mm-hmm. So it's not super expensive. Right. But what if you took on an intern? And now maybe that intern, you you mentor him, maybe he serves in the church, but you use that additional manpower to either free up the senior or an associate pastor or the intern himself if he if he's cut out for it. Maybe there's an elder that lives out in Valley Center or that direction. And that elder has a vision for that. And so you take a year this is and you pray about it. Mm-hmm. And But I think that intern pr- pr- provides an additional uh, set of manpower resources. Because you go to a church and you say, you should really be planting a church. It's like, all right, you have a full-time job, yeah. probably more, probably 60 hours a week yeah. on a good yeah. week, right? Where, where are you going to get the time to do that? Everyone is fully tasked out and you're asking them to do more. Right. Well, that's a great plan. But if you do more, you're going to do less of something else. I mean, yeah. life's a series of trade-offs. So at the end of the day, mm-hmm. it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen well unless we commit additional resources. Right. And right. I think additional resources at the exploratory stage, the deliberative stage, maybe nothing comes of it. But what if you had an elder in any direction from this church who has a 20 or 30 minute commute and they think, mm-hmm. well, there's a community 10 minutes the other direction. Mm-hmm. And we do. We do. And and you pray mm-hmm. about that. You take your time with it. You know, mm-hmm. you go to classes, you talk to people, you say, yeah. we, we want to get in this game. We want to have a you know, you do a lot of mission work, you support mission works in lots of different yeah. ways, but we want to support this kind of home mission work. Mm-hmm. Use a young guy, and maybe he's the guy, maybe he's not. Yeah. But that year of seasoning will teach him, yeah, we'll that's train him. Really good, Brian. I um, think that's a really helpful suggestion. And I think 
across the mm-hmm. URC, if every classes could develop internship programs, give money to them so the money is sitting there, mm-hmm. begging people to use it. Now, that's a recipe potentially for waste, so you have to put safeguards around it. You mm-hmm. don't want to spend poor money. But by having a fund, we now are able to say, and I've said this to a bunch of young guys here at the seminary. I'm uh, Chuck Tedricks let me meet with some young guys this afternoon, yeah. which is a dangerous thing to let them meet. <laughs> yeah. um, and I've said, like, we, we have this fund in Classes East. Yeah. It doesn't guarantee that there's a church in a position to do it, yeah. but it makes it easier. Yeah. You know, like, you want to you wanna tax things that you want less of and subsidize things you want more of. <laughs> That's how you build policy. And a fund, a, a granting program, is a subsidy that encourages a behavior. So you create mm-hmm. healthy incentives. Right. And I think across the Federation, uh, across Reformed churches, we could think more about what kind of incentive structures are in place that we take for granted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So like I just said, we have incentive yeah. structures for old guys staying in their established churches, mm-hmm. young guys going out and doing foolish things. That's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> yeah, Let's right. change those incentives. Yeah. Yeah.